For humanity, the moon represents more than just a dot in the night sky. It is Earth's natural satellite and is directly responsible for the way our world functions. While we have already visited the lunar surface back in 1969, returning there has remained a big priority for NASA. The Artemis mission will not only return humans to the moon, it will also prepare us to venture further. Let's talk about some of the things the mission is expected to discover. The historic launch of the Apollo 11 mission carried three astronauts toward the moon. Two of them would set foot on the lunar surface for the first time in human history as millions of people around the world followed their steps on television. The crew of Apollo 11 were all experienced astronauts who had been to space before. Mission planners at NASA studied the lunar surface for two years, searching for the best place to make the historic landing. They examined the best high-resolution photographs available at the time from the Lunar Orbiter and Surveyor programs and considered the number of craters and boulders, cliffs and hills at each prospective landing site and how easy it would be for the astronauts to land given their fuel and time requirements. This helped the planners narrow down the initial 30 sites candidates to three. Apollo 11 launched from Kennedy Space Center in Florida on July 16, 1969. While in flight, the crew made two televised broadcasts from the interior of the ship and a third transmission as they drew closer to the moon, revealing the lunar surface and the intended approach path. On July 20th, Armstrong and Aldrin entered the lunar module, nicknamed the Eagle, and separated from the command service module, the Columbia, and headed toward the lunar surface. For the first two hours on the moon, Armstrong and Aldrin remained in the module and checked all the systems, configured the craft for its stay on the moon. In consultation with NASA, the astronauts decided to skip their scheduled four-hour rest and opted to go outside and explore the moon's surface instead. While on the surface, the astronauts set up several experiments, collected samples of lunar soil and rock to bring home, erected a United States flag, and took core samples from the crust. The time the crew of Apollo 11 spent on the lunar surface remains the most experience any human has had in trying to survive on a hostile surface much different than the Earth. The Apollo 11 mission remains widely celebrated, and NASA hopes to rekindle humanity's spirit for exploration with the upcoming Artemis missions. Not only will these missions return us to the moon, they will help prepare astronauts to venture even deeper into space and prepare for the long journey to Mars, which inevitably awaits humanity. At the center of the Artemis program are NASA's new mega rocket, the Space Launch System, and the Orion spacecraft. The SLS is a 322-foot-tall rocket consisting of a core range, upper stage, and twin five-segment solid rocket boosters to launch a payload into space. For crewed Artemis missions, the rocket will launch the Orion spacecraft to the moon. Orion is a space capsule larger than the Apollo Command modules that are designed to carry four astronauts on missions to the moon. The 42-day Artemis 1 mission will test the Orion spacecraft, a capsule that will orbit the moon and one day carry human crew members there. Once in the atmosphere, Orion will begin in Earth's orbit, then soar through space powered by the interim cryogenic propulsion stage, a 45-foot-long cylindrical system with one engine. As Orion flies toward the moon, a service module provided by the European Space Agency will course correct as needed. The spacecraft will complete up to one and a half revolutions in lunar orbit, where it will set a record for the farthest any spacecraft that can carry a crew has traveled. Then it'll fire its engines at just the right time to be propelled back toward Earth with the aid of the moon's gravity. Later, the Orion spacecraft will make a roaring return to our atmosphere. It'll be moving at 6.8 miles per second, the fastest re-entry of any capsule built for humans. The craft and its heat shield will have to endure temperatures of 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit, a crucial part of this test mission since NASA can't artificially create these conditions on the ground. If it survives, Orion will splash down in the Pacific Ocean off the coast of San Diego within view of a U.S. Navy ship that will recover the spacecraft. On Artemis 1's launch day, powered by two solid rocket boosters and four mighty engines, the SLS will thunder into the skies, drop its empty propellant tanks into the ocean, and then separate from Orion. The capsule will use a smaller, European-built propulsion system to set itself on course to fly past the moon. Though Artemis 1 won't launch with any crew, Orion won't be empty. Stowed aboard the capsule is a suite of experiments designed to help keep astronauts safe on future Artemis flights, a major focus being exposure to deep space radiation. A total of 10 CubeSats are hitching a ride aboard Artemis 1, with three focused on radiation. 
These include a space weather station for measuring particles and magnetic fields, an imaging device to be deployed at the Earth-Moon Lagrange Point 2 to measure radiation in Earth's plasma sphere, and a study of single-celled yeast to observe the effects of deep space radiation on living organisms. Other CubeSats will conduct studies of the lunar surface using infrared cameras to search for water, as well as near-surface hydrogen in the permanently shadowed regions around the lunar south pole. One CubeSat, dubbed NEA Scout, will deploy in the CIS lunar orbit and spend two years utilizing solar sail technology to intercept and capture images of 2020 GE, an asteroid less than 60 feet wide. Strapped into Orion's commander's chair is a mannequin called Commander Munikin Campos. Named for Arturo Campos, the electrical power subsystem manager for the Apollo 13 lunar module, who helped bring that troubled mission safely back to Earth. Munikin Campos is equipped with two internal radiation sensors, with additional sensors embedded in the mannequin seat to measure vibration and acceleration forces during the mission. The Munikin will also be wearing NASA's new Orion Crew Survival System suit. The orange flight suit resembles similar suits used during space shuttle missions, but features a plethora of upgrades. Orion's flight suit is designed to be worn for up to six days, and it features a feeding tube access port on the helmet, so astronauts don't have to depressurize their suits to eat. The suit's familiar orange color allows rescue teams to more easily spot astronauts in the event of an in-flight emergency. The suit launching on Artemis 1 fits the Munikin perfectly, and once assembly begins on suits for real astronauts, each will be custom-built for the wear as opposed to the comparable one-size-fits-most suits from the shuttle era. Two other torso-only mannequins will accompany Munich and Campos to aid in onboard radiation studies. Referred to as phantoms, each is constructed from materials that mimic human bone and tissue, as well as organs unique to adult females, such as breast tissue and ovaries, which are susceptible to radiation damage. The phantoms have their own names, Helga and Zohar, and each is equipped with over 6,000 passive radiation detectors and 34 active radiation detectors. The pair will serve as part of the Matroshka Astrorad Radiation Experiment, an international research partnership between the German Aerospace Center, the Israel Space Agency, and NASA. Zohar will be wearing an Astrorad vest, which is designed to allow astronauts to leave shelter areas of Orion and other spacecraft during solar radiation events while maintaining their protection. Helga will not be wearing the Astrorad vest, and researchers plan to compare exposure rate differences between Helga and Zohar upon Orion's return. The Orion spacecraft itself is also equipped with several radiation detectors. The radiation area monitor consists of six passive sensors to record total radiation exposure through the end of the mission, and the European Space Agency has placed five active dosimeters throughout the vessel to monitor radiation levels in real time. A critical part of Orion's radiation exposure prevention systems includes the Hybrid Electronic Radiation Assessor. HERA is designed to serve as part of Orion's caution and warning system, which can alert astronauts to incoming solar particle events, allowing crews to preemptively seek shelter. Radiation in deep space doesn't just affect humans. Biology Experiment 1, which is also stowed aboard Orion, houses four investigations to study the effects of radiation on plants and fungi. The experiment will focus on changes in the nutritional value of seeds, how fungi repair their DNA, yeast adaptability, and algal gene expression. Researchers hope observing these different biological systems will lead to further innovations in the ability of humans to survive long-term on the Moon and Mars. Artemis 2 is scheduled for launch in 2024 and is expected to carry the first four astronauts. The Orion capsule will take the crew farther from Earth than humans have ever traveled before. The crew will complete a lunar flyby and return to Earth, evaluating the spacecraft systems while carrying humans. Artemis 2 will demonstrate critical functions including mission planning, system performance, crew interfaces, and navigation and guidance beyond low Earth orbit. After launching, SLS will orbit the Earth twice, firing its engines to build up the speed to push it to the moon. The entire mission will last approximately 21 days. Artemis 3 is the second crewed mission of the program and the first to land astronauts on the moon. The crew will visit the moon's south pole to search for water, study its surface, test technologies, and learn to work on a world outside Earth. This will see the next man and first woman step onto the lunar surface. 
Provided previous missions have been successful, the astronauts will shoot towards the moon, using the lunar lander to lower two people to the moon's south polar region. They will remain on the moon for around a week. Space exploration leads to new scientific discoveries, significant economic benefits, and inspiration for people to reach farther and higher. It is not just financial expenditure with no return. It earns back in spades and sometimes in ways we can't predict. The invention of cordless tools and Velcro are often associated with NASA and space exploration. In reality, those were invented before the Apollo program. Although those weren't invented because of space exploration, there are plenty of things that have been, from memory foam to suits for race car drivers to cancer-sniffing instruments. A landing on the moon also provided a unique view of Earth that showed our big blue marble in space. We, the humans of this planet, need to go back to the moon for many reasons, but the most important one is the challenge, to extend ourselves to innovate and progress. The effort put into this will lead to new ways to look at and solve problems not only for living and working in space, but for improving how we live and work on Earth. If you found this video informative, you may also like this one, which talks about SpaceX and its new artificial gravity starship. Do you think NASA should set up a base on the moon? Please share your thoughts in the comments section below.